Uh, also, what you will not find in your announcements yet is we will have a Blessing of the Animals worship service. Uh, the intent is to hopefully have it outside. Uh, if not, we will welcome the animals inside as well. But that's going to be August 13th. So put that on your calendars. Uh, it's a worship that focuses on God's creation and the gift of animals in our life, uh, especially our pets. And every animal that uh, comes will receive an individual blessing from myself and possibly from somebody else, uh, depending upon how many people we have bring, bringing their animals along. But again, uh, an opportunity for a unique worship service to celebrate the, those gifts in our lives. So, um, are there any other announcements? Jessica's got one. I do. I do. <laughs> Just for fun, I'm going to share this. Jordan and I playfully and joyfully follow the National Day Calendar. You can find it at nationaldaycalendar.com. And most of the stuff we follow is about food. National Chocolate Day is one of our favorites, and our family loves National Eat Ice Cream for Breakfast Day. We celebrate that one every year. But today was important. It's National Vanilla Ice Cream Day. And it's a little bland, but okay. But it's also National Parents Day and National Gorgeous Grandma Day. So to all you gorgeous grandmas and parents, your kids and grandkids need to be getting you some vanilla ice cream today. <laughs> So now you all have something forward to look forward to for the rest of the day after worship um, on these national, national celebrations. So I now invite you to stand in body or spirit as you feel comfortable. We're going to sing our song of preparation. It's an insert in your bulletins. It's You Are My Strength When I Am Weak. I'm going to have Jason play through it once and then we're going to sing the first ones.
us now join together, affirming our faith as found in our bulletin as we read the Apostles' Creed. Let us share in this statement, recognizing the triune presence of God with us. Please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us give thanks in song through our Gloria Pacha. be with you. Let us turn to our neighbor in love and share a sign of peace or love. Peace. And don't forget about our friends on Facebook and on Zoom joining us. So peace and love to each and every one. And as you're being seated, I'm going to invite the children to come on up for the children's message today. Stay right here. Stay right there. I'm going to grab something and come right back. All right. A rock and a pillow. Yeah, I got a rock and a pillow. What? Now, which ones do you guys like to sleep with? Pillows, right? They're pretty soft, right? Yeah, not rocks. Not a rock. You sure? Yeah. Have you ever tried sleeping with a rock as your pillow? No. Yeah. Do you want to try it? Yes. No. Okay, Caleb wants to try it. Yes. So, Don't here. I'll tell you what, move over a little bit. Caleb, why don't you go ahead and lay down, and I'll help guide your head down so you don't slam your head against the rock. All right? Nice and gentle. Nice and gentle. Here we go. We're cheering you on. How's that feel? Ow! Ow? <laughs> okay. So, I guess you probably wouldn't want to sleep with a rock as a pillow, would you? No, thumbs down. And well, you know, <laughs> well, in, in the Bible, in one of the passages I'm going to read today, I'm actually going to tell you about a man who slept with a rock as a pillow. His name is Jacob. So his brother Esau was chasing him. So Jacob was out in the desert and he was looking for a place to sleep. And he didn't have a pillow with him. So he used a rock as his pillow. And during his sleep, while he was sleeping, yeah. he had a dream, a really special dream. He saw a ladder reaching way up into the heavens and angels going up and down and up and down the ladder. And then he heard a voice and the voice said, don't worry, Jacob, I am with you. I know what the And he woke up from the dream. And he realized, oh, God is in this place. God was in the place where he had the worst night's sleep possible with a rock as a pillow. So you know what he did? What? He took that rock and a whole bunch of other rocks 
and put him together as a monument to God and called it Beth El. And Beth El in Hebrew means house of God. And hence there is now a place in Israel called Beth El. So, and why God did this was to remind Jacob that no matter how bad things are and no matter where we are, God is with us. I think that's pretty cool. So, all right, nope, time for our prayer. All right, like an echo. All right, ready? Here we go. Dear God, we thank you for always being with us, no matter how hard it is. Amen. And so, I gave you a nice summary of our first reading for today, which comes from uh, the, the book of Genesis, chapter 29. Uh, so here now the story of Jacob and his dream of Bethel. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring back and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. And I'll tell you, there were so many good lectionary passages for this week. It was hard because I love that story of Jacob's ladder. But I decided to go back to our gospel text in Matthew for our sermon, for our message for today. And this is the parable of the weeds among the wheat. So here now, these verses from Matthew chapter 13. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Then do you want, to go, do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be with the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out his kingdom, all causes of sin, and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous one will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father and let anyone with ears 
listen. This is the word of our Lord. Friends, let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I know I'm going to test some of your memories a little bit here today, but I want you to try to remember the feeling of dread that overcame you when you went back to your school days and you were told by your teacher that there was going to be a pop quiz that day. Some of you remember. Well, did that probably felt a feeling of panic in you, did it? Some kind of anxiousness. And I'm sure the thought may have passed through your head. Boy, I wish I would have studied on this last night. But then, I want you also to imagine how you might have felt when, after your teacher made that announcement, your teacher then said, but it's an open book quiz. Woo! <laughs> I heard you guys. So... Isn't that what you would have felt right then, right? You had that anxiousness, and then you had that relief, right? Well, I think that's part of the feeling that goes along with this parable that's being shared today. When Jesus relates this parable of the farmer planting the seeds, he tells his listeners right at the onset that the events of the story that he's going to share may be compared to the kingdom of heaven. All right? So this is a tip from the teacher, and it should help prompt them to listen to what I'm going to tell you very carefully as Jesus is busy, you know, providing this explanation. But even this information is not enough for the disciples, who are often confused and bewildered and unsure of what Jesus says. So what do they do? They wait. They wait until all the crowds are done. You know, they've had their fill, they've had their meal, the crowds are all gone now. And then the disciples approach Jesus and ask the teacher, We don't get it. Can you explain this to us, please? I take heart in that statement. I take comfort in the fact that the disciples ask Jesus to explain this to him. Now, I know as a pastor, you know, it's like, well, you study the Bible, you, you do all this work on it, you should know all this stuff, right? No. So I take comfort in that, in their willingness to ask for help. Because that's a good first step in learning something, isn't it? Is asking for help, realizing how much we have to learn, no matter how much we think we already know. There's a saying attributed to Buddha that states, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Now, that's a statement that's very profound. It's not until we've come to that place of readiness to accept what we are being taught. It is at that time that the teacher really flourishes. And I know many of you have been teachers in your life and in your career. So you know that experience. You know that feeling. Well, here in our passage today, the disciples recognize their need and their desire to learn. And so they turn to their teacher for explanation, for illumination. And their hearts were open and they were ready to receive the wisdom that Jesus had to offer. Now, when we think about that, wouldn't we all be better off if we would try to not to pretend to understand everything that's going on around us, as if everything in our lives was just hinky-dory, that we didn't have any questions that needed answered, or we didn't have any problems that needed to be solved, right? Well, what would happen in our lives, though, if we turned that on its side, if we made ourselves more vulnerable, and we said, you know what, I don't understand this. I need help. I can't do this all by myself. It's a really vulnerable place to put ourselves, isn't it? Possibly uncomfortable. But what experience has shown me throughout my life is that when you're willing to do that, 
that fear gets put aside and help shows up in abundance. Tons of people will come out and help and offer support and guidance and illumination to whatever it is that you're asking for. But they won't often offer it until you ask for it. And the reason this is important is because life is not meant to be a test that we struggle through without any help. Jesus demonstrates a very heavenly open book quiz when he responds to the disciples with this insight and this instruction. Jesus provides the disciples with encouragement and wisdom that will help them as they endeavor to be followers of Christ. It's as if the test that Jesus is preparing them for is actually their own discipleship, their work, their calling, and that Jesus as their teacher then supplies them with all the answers they need to be faithful and effective in what they're called to do. And make no mistake, it is often easier to be the one who offers help than the one to receive it, right? We love to be teachers, don't we? Especially about things we know. So it's hard for us, sometimes as teachers, to ask for the help that we need. Because there are times when, just like the disciples, we need to be led, we need to ask for assistance. And Jesus encourages that attitude of seeking wisdom by reminding them, let anyone with ears listen. Jesus is a teacher. His name was Rabbi, which means in Hebrew, teacher. Jesus wants to teach the disciples. Jesus wants to teach each and every one of us. And so we should be ready and encouraged to learn. And so Jesus does this as he begins to inform his followers of the very real dangers that exist in the world. You see, the farmer did everything right when we go back to our story. He plants good seeds, he plants it in good soil, and he faithfully tends his fields. Yet despite his diligence, an enemy appears and spreads weeds throughout his crop. And so the story reminds us that despite our good intentions and despite our best efforts, there can be setbacks and obstacles that threaten to ruin even the best laid plans. So simply hearing Jesus acknowledge that there are times when things go wrong, that's reassuring, isn't it? We often place a really heavy burden on ourselves by imagining that our actions and our, our, our faith are completely in control of all the events in our lives. The reality is, is that's not so. We really do want to believe that our faith should protect us from every misfortune. But that's really not so. The truth remains that there are other factors that work in the world. And sometimes these misfortunes result in evil things happening. Bad things simply happen sometimes. We, all, we hear a phrase, a very old phrase, that to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Right? Well, Jesus is providing a warning to the disciples and to us that we should anticipate challenges and interference along our journey of faith and life. And Jesus states clearly that things will go wrong and that events do not always work in our favor. So that our best laid plans and the most good hearted intentions that we may have can get screwed up through no fault of our own. Granted, we're perfectly capable of screwing them up well in ourselves. But the reality is that we can point to a concrete cause sometimes. But there are other times when we are completely baffled about how circumstances have seemingly lined up against us. This illness after this illness after this illness after this bad job thing after this bad family thing, they just sometimes line up that way by no fault of our own. <clears throat> So whether it's something that we screw up well ourselves or something that somebody else screws up for us or just bad circumstances, no matter what the case is, we can be reassured that unfortunate events in our lives does not indicate that we are separated from the love of God. Misfortune and great needs are not outside of God's concern. God, I would dare say, is probably more embedded in those circumstances than in others. 
Those scary, challenging, and frustrating places in our lives where we need God most, that's where we find God the most. And that's what Jesus is trying to do, is to offer an assurance that we should not lose heart. Just as Jacob was in a frustrating place, he was fearful for his life. He slept with a rock as a pillow. God reminded him that God would always be beside him. And so as we turn back to our passage in, in Matthew, the natural impulse of the farmer's workers then is to immediately get rid of the threat. To get rid of the weeds, to gather up and destroy them and burn them. But it comes as a surprise to them when their master, who is God in this parable, cautions them, wait, slow down. He warns them that in the process of trying to get rid of those weeds, that they might destroy the good plants in the process of uprooting those dangerous weeds. The plants, he explains, can look very similar when they are young, and the workers need to wait until the plants mature and reveal their true characteristics. And in this process, Jesus seems to be encouraging the disciples and us to be very careful about making judgments about others. It can be difficult, he teaches, to discern which is the weed and which is the valuable wheat. After all, we don't want to toss out the precious crop being hasteful or being uninformed or being unaware. Rather, Jesus is encouraging us to allow them both to grow and that the farmer will then separate the weeds from the, leaf, the wheat at a later time when things can be clearly discerned. For example, some of my family members will know this, all of us should know that we need to avoid poison ivy. Many people have allergic reactions to poison ivy. Anybody ever had poison ivy around here? <laughs> I'd see many hands. What happens? You get itchy, scratchy, you get really uncomfortable. No one wants to grow poison ivy in their yard, right? And so what do we do? We look at those plants in that yard, and what do we look for? We look for that, that three little leaf pattern on the plants, right? Leaves of three, let it be. <laughs> Leaves of three, let it be. See, Caleb knows. So you're right. And it's very easy to identify poison ivy that way, but also there are also some very helpful plants that also have leaves of three in it. And if we would yank out those harmful plants out of the ground, you know, or if we if we're hang, if we're hanging if we're tearing out those harmless plants out of the ground, you know, well, what happens is we actually make more room for poison ivy to grow. So not only are you destroying the good stuff, you're creating more space for the bad stuff to grow. So we wait. And that's what this parable is here to remind us of. It's the importance of remembering of the offer of grace, one to ourselves, of the grace that we have received, but also being graceful to one another. After all, it's not our job to judge one another. We can't wait you know, we can wait to let God take care of that for us. You see, the person who might, in our critical eyes, be of very little value, who might be a troublemaker, the one who may disrupt things, may in fact actually be someone who is loving and serving God the only way that they know how. And so instead of ignoring someone or feeling disdain for them, because of our perceptions of judgment, what we should be doing is really caring for all of God's people, showing grace and love and hope for each and every one. And if we do that, we might just be surprised at who we discover those people to be. When we get to meet them and learn about them and see who they are and what they're doing, we get to see what their real intentions are. I think another good example of this is old Western movies, right? Everyone know what fool's gold is? See some heads? Yeah. Yeah, we see that in the old Western movies, right? 
you got, you got the miners out there, they come across this bright yellow stone, and you know, they think they might have a, a discovery of gold, but they're not sure, right? So what do they do? Bite. They take it and they bite on it. That's right, Tim. They bite on it. And why do they bite on it? Well, if it's fool's gold, you're not going to bite very hard because it's going to hurt. Because gold is a soft metal. If you bite gold, it will leave an indentation in it because it's soft. That's how they were identifying fool's gold versus real gold. Because biting down on it reveals the truth. Well, for us in our lives, sometimes we need to go deeper and seek more information. Rather than judging something just by its appearance, we need to chew on it a little bit to see what it's like and what their intentions are. And in that process, we might actually discover something even more valuable than gold. We might find a diamond in the rough. Someone who on the outside may have appeared to have little value winds up being quite valuable. And Jesus is warning his followers not to be too eager now. Don't be so eager to start that weeding process, to throw things into the fire. Because in the process of trying to rid themselves of that weed, of that weak link, they might actually be hurting others who are trying to love and serve the Lord, to try and share their love with one another. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Isn't that the great commandment? That's what Jesus is wanting to make sure of in this process. And so, when you get that pop quiz that shows up in your life, that, that test that shows up, Jesus has given you the answers in advance. Trust the teacher. Because Jesus knows that an unlikely group of people can come together, just like his disciples, united by their faith in God and in one another. And so that together, those individuals will shine like the sun and spread God's hope and joy and love and grace for all. Amen. Friends, as we continue our worship this day, Jason has a song of reflection that he's picked out for us. So sit and reflect on our word this day as he offers us this day. Friends, as we go to this time of prayer, are there joys or concerns to share with the good of all gathered today?
Gee. I'm afraid I've got a list of neighbors that are having problems. Maureen, the lady that I had to spoken to you about with back surgery, is a number of them. She just had another one. And the first one was a success, but when she moved, another rod in her back broke. So they had to brush her back in and take that out. So that's one. Another neighbor, Al, which I had mentioned before, he's got uh, tumors in his chest and around his heart. And he's going to get biopsy to find out if they're cancerous or not. And uh, other than that, I think everybody else is doing pretty good. <laughs> Gene, you touch so many people. We, we appreciate that and how you bring them into prayer for us. So um, may we continue to pray for Maureen and Al as they struggle with their health issues. May Maureen's back surgeries result in something firm and steady and strong. And, uh, and Al's biopsies may they be clean and uh, found to be made with those tumors or not going to be as uh, injurious as they could be. So thank you for lifting them in prayer. With that. Any others? Yes. Um, my friend Alyssa's mom has cancer and the charm is in all next week. All right, Jill. So, for your friend Alyssa's mom, cancer, that evil, evil, five, six letter word. Gosh. May, uh, may God surround her with talented doctors and wisdom to what steps she needs to take next. Nigel. A, a couple of things. Um, one, um, a good friend of ours, he recently um, fulfilled his dream of a motorcycle, but unfortunately he was hit on a motorcycle and hit in an accident. And judging by the scene of the accident, he shouldn't be alive today. But by God's glory, he's still with us, you know, with a couple of, you know, broken legs and, you know, things like that. He's, he's on the wind right now, and he's vowing never to buy another motorcycle again. <laughs> um, and, and Saturday, a friend of mine yesterday, she spent her birthday um, handing out White Castle hamburgers to the homelessness and, um, and you know, people, homeless in my manage. And um, she, she had expressed the fact that it was just sad to see so many young people out there that's drug addicted <coughs> and as homeless and um, suffering from mental illness. So I just want to um, pray for those people that are suffering with those um, afflictions. Yes, indeed. So, I mean, thanks be to God for your friends surviving that accident, especially during the summer. Bicycling and motorcycling accidents are prevalent, so may God surround them in a hedge of protection and you know, provides them safety and comfort during the rides and uh, a blessing of recovery uh, from a friend's accident. But indeed, as we are so often reminded, the, the plight of the homeless, the, the pain and uh, discomfort, and as you, as you, as you well uh, mentioned, mental illness that they're afflicted, and so many things not addressed uh, in our culture, in our society, may, you know, even the smallest of gifts be a blessing to them and encourage them uh, as they continue to seek, seek out help and love uh, from others. Thank you. Thank you. Any others to share today? Yes, ma'am. seen any others, let us go to God in the spirit of prayer. We're going to sing our prayer song, Lord, listen to your children praying. Amen. 
heal the sick, care for those cast aside, energize the exhausted, lighten the load of those overwhelmed, and calm this world's warring madness, shelter the innocent. Master Gardener, we walk among weeds and wheat, oftentimes unaware of the difference between good and evil. Help us to discern your will and your way. Guide our feet as we walk and work in the garden of your world. Nurture us in good soil, and may our lives contribute to your kingdom to come. May our toils support the growth of your harvest. And as the father welcomes the prodigal home, as the mother hand covers and protects her chicks, you welcome us, love us, and receive us. For no matter who we are or where we are in our life and faith journey, we know that you are with us. So as we come to you in prayer, we, also, we ask that you also seek out when we are lost, when others are lost, and help to love us and others until we find our way home. We sing your praise today, glorious God, and we dedicate our lives to your faithful path. And now, as the body of Christ, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, out of our thankfulness, let us shift to our opportunity to, to give to others. God dwells among us, making all things new, promising us grace as we encourage our fields to grow for a bountiful harvest. And so let us participate in this opportunity of harvest as we give our gifts to God. Uh, our gifts are being received in the basket in the back. You can place them anytime you like, as well as um, you can give online through our website uh, or on our mobile app. Let us then celebrate our gifts of God with our song, our doxology. <laughs>
Friends, we are called to shine like the sun. And how do we do that? By sharing God's love and grace and mercy with all that we meet. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and grant you peace. Now and always. And all God's people say. Amen.